Now, you know the subject I have been asked to talk to you about tonight, and I'd like to tell the devil now, if he thinks he's going to get the praise around here from this preacher tonight, he's dismissed. I don't like to scare people. They're out there, but I'm, I can show you a remedy tonight uh, and safety and peace that you may have never dreamed, if you don't know this, that exists. All of the people out from under the blood should be afraid. Nobody else should ever spend one moment worrying about anything. Somebody said to me, there's a fellow across town, that's several months ago, prophesying you're going to die tonight. T.W. Barnes will die tonight. Well, I said, I'll die when the Lord gets ready for me to go. And I went on to preach that night and forgot it and woke up the next day, over in the day, I said, mm, I was supposed to have died last night, and I forgot all about it. And that's the way we ought to do. Forget it. Amen. If you're full of the Holy Ghost, forget what the devil says. Not long ago, they brought a Satan worshiper in my office, a witch. She was reared in witchcraft, went back in her family. And this lady had persuaded her to come over and talk to me. And, of course, she hated me from the moment she walked in. I could see it in her eyes and feel it. And she said, I don't understand why I even come. Said, I, I'll tell you this, I do worship Satan because Satan hears and answers my prayer. Said, your God don't answer. I said, you're wrong. My God does answer. I said, the reason you haven't heard from him, you don't believe he is. She said, well, I've got a heat key that hangs my door, and if I asked Satan, I said, I asked him tonight, I said, if you want me to go there and talk to that preacher or this woman tonight, cause the key to go to the right, and if you don't want me to go, cause it to go to the left. And she said, it swung to the right. I said, well, I don't know who swung the key, but I don't think the devil did, because he never has sent any of his clients over to see me. <laughs> of course, she <clears throat> supposed to be in this dimension and where they could move things, you know, make it jump around, you know, tables and lights and whatever. So she said, I'll show you my God has power. And she was going to demonstrate because of my ceiling lights in my office to go round and round. I said, you'll never be able to do it. You won't move nothing in this building, in this office. I said, she, she sat out and she tried. Her eyes stuck out like snake eyes. Brother, she was trying her best to make them swing. And she must have undoubtedly been able to do it or she wouldn't have been trying so hard like that. Finally, she said, uh, you're right, I can't. said, why? I said, there's a power in this room that's greater than the power that you serve. Amen. Hallelujah. She couldn't even move the curtains, much less the light. She couldn't have moved the toothpick. There was another power. Amen. But she turned and she said, Okay. Said, Have you ever had any spirits come to your bedside? I said, Yeah. She said, There's going to be some at your bed tonight. I said, Okay. So when I got home, 
I said in Jesus' name, whatever she tells them devils to come over here and do, I command them to go back and do it to her. <laughs> now, she had told this lady she's riding home. I said, he won't sleep tonight. She said, oh, I said, if he don't sleep, it'll be because he's out trying to help somebody. In two minutes, I was asleep, and I slept sound all night long. No devil bothered me. But in a few nights, she called me. She said, Preacher, I'm about to go crazy. I said, Yeah. <laughs> she said, I can't get these spirits away from my bed. I said, You, why did you try to send them over here? I said, I sent them back. She said, They've been here day and night. And I can't rest. I can't sleep. What am I going to do? I said, repent. Yeah. She said, I put a spell on my mother-in-law. And that's not unusual, you know. <laughs> said, she's dying, though. I said, I'm feeling bad about it, and I can't get the spell off of her. I put it on, but I can't get it off. I said, all witches cast spells with the spirit of hate. I said, you hate your mother-in-law, don't you? She said, yes. I said, forgive her and love her. She said, I can't. I said, okay, you're going to be tormented devils then. And I said, whenever she dies, well, it'll just be worse. She said, please tell me what to do. I said, get on your knees and say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I know that you have more power than the devil. And I want you to forgive me, and I want you to cleanse me, and I'm going to forgive my mama-in-law. She said, preacher, you the, I've been to psychiatrists. I've been everywhere. said, you're the only person's ever told me the truth. I know you've told me the truth. Whether I can do it, I don't know. Well, I'm still expecting her to come to church and get the Holy Ghost. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You know, I was thinking of something I read a few weeks ago. Perhaps you read it in the paper. They have found now, so they say, a hundred trillion. That's pretty good number 100 trillion galaxies out in space and they say that every galaxy or milky way has 300 trillion stars in it and i got to thinking about it i said and god knows every one of them by name and you think about how long it take him to count them if all of them if he used a second for each count you think of that now, the reason I said that, and of course, I, I don't think they know how, I, I think they've just sort of got out of the backyard. They, they're still, they're like a little ant crawling out of an ant bed, you know, and he can't see but 50 feet. And he said, my, this is a big world. That's about where science is today. Uh, if they could see a little further, they'd find out many more probably. But what I'm saying is this. The devil never even created one of them. The Lord created every galaxy and every star and knows every one of them by name. And they all stand up to his attention and the devil had nothing to do with it. The devil never created a human being. He never created an eyeball. He's knocked some of them out, but he's never created anything. In fact, since Calvary, he is as weak as last year's branch water. He's whipped, he's defeated, he's out there, he's only hurting those that don't know. If they only knew. And that's what we want to talk about tonight. And I like what Brother Harding said about now. Now, you know, 
while the iron gate opened for Peter, he was walking toward it. He wasn't sitting over there saying, well, if it ever opens up, I'll get up and go. I found out that when you march with faith, the Lord always has an angel open the gate. But he's not going to do it for anybody that's sitting down. You've got to march. You've got to believe now. Let's move. In fact, I don't have enough of faith to scatter it over 50 years myself. Uh, mine runs out sometime. I have to go back for more. Pinpoint it. Bring it down. Anybody's got enough of faith for right now? Everybody say now. now. The Lord has power now over all the power of the devil. Now let me read. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, and against rulers of darkness of this world and against spiritual wickedness in high places. We wrestle against spiritual wickedness in high places. I was praying the other day and I read this and I said, Oh Lord, the devil has sent his most powerful angels to attack the inspired word of God and the virgin birth, the blood of Jesus Christ, the name of Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Ghost. He has focused all of his power with his most powerful angels upon these four things. The Word, the Blood, the Name, and the Holy Ghost. And I said, oh God, if Satan has sent his most powerful angels to get a hold of preachers and make them rewrite the Bible, or try to. The World Council of Churches, through addictive things they're talking about. The church needs you and the most powerful angels in heaven to help us preach this truth and see results. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. The blood is so close to his heart. The name is so close to him. And we should have far more results than we are having when we preach it. So it's in lack of faith in what we're preaching. I want to talk to you tonight about the power of the blood covenant. The power of the blood covenant. And tonight, as we picture this to you, we'll be using... Going back in the Old Testament, the Egyptians, the Philistines, all these were natural enemies that attacked Israel. But today it isn't flesh and blood, but spiritual wickedness in high places. But we watch the move in the Old Testament. The Old Testament covenant and then the New Testament covenant, which is the better covenant, the, the covenant that you and I are in today, is the better covenant. But let us look for a little while tonight at the powerful Old Testament blood covenant. It started outside the Garden of Eden. And the blood sacrifices has been offered up or until the real Lamb of God was offered up 2,000 years ago. When Abraham was circumcised and God said, there's the ram, here they cut the blood covenant. And the thing I want you to see tonight is the blood covenant cannot 
be broken, God will not break the blood covenant that he's made. Never in a million years will he break it. When he found Abraham, he found a man that would not break the blood covenant. When he said, take your son, Isaac, and offer him up, he would not break that covenant that he made with God. And he would have offered that boy up, but the hand of God stayed him. And from that day forward, we see God standing behind the people that made the blood covenant with him. Now when Moses stood at the burning bush, there he was brought in contact again. Moses knew the power of the blood covenant. When he left there with a rod in his hand that would turn to a serpent, he knew the power of this blood covenant and what God would do and how God would stand behind his blood covenant. Praise God. And as he stood before Pharaoh and lifted that rod, his faith was in the blood covenant. He knew that God would not let him down. I want you to watch. After that night, the Lord said, if you'll put the blood on the doorpost, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. When I see the blood, I'll pass over you. Not one soul will be harmed if I find the blood there. They were once again reminded of the blood covenant. And it was put on the doorpost. And that night, as they sat there waiting for the midnight hour, all through Egypt, there was a cry went up. But not one Israelite was touched because they had the blood on the doorpost. I thank God tonight. Oh, the peace that I've had in dens of demons because I knew I had joined the blood covenant. I had taken his blood into me and his faith into me and I had nothing to fear whatsoever. But I want you to watch Israel as she stands on the shores of the Red Sea. And all of a sudden, they see the Egyptians coming with all the chariots and horsemen, flashing shields, and their hearts melted as they stood there and they looked at the enemy. Listen to me tonight, saints. But Moses said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. There was a preacher there that knew the power of the blood covenant. Amen. He had his faith in it. He knew about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He knew about the blood covenants and the sacrifices. And he stood there and he said, just wait and you'll see the salvation of the Lord. And when he lifted the rod, a cloud came between Israel and the enemy. I want you to see this. We're in a world full of demons everywhere. But those that understand the blood covenant, the cloud will fall between the demons and us just like it did there on the shores of the Red Sea. The enemy was in darkness, but the children of Israel, the children of the blood covenant was in the light. And all night long, they marched across the Red Sea while the enemy was blinded by the power of Almighty God. How often I have seen this happen demonstrated before my very eyes when demonic powers were attacked and watched them fall even before they got to where they wanted to get. Fall out, 
slain by the power of Almighty God. Moses waited for God because he had faith. And then as they stepped out on the other side, suddenly there was no water. Finally they came to a water hole. And they thought, right here, we'll fill up our water bottles. But the waters were bitter. But Moses found a tree and cast it into the waters. And they became sweet and they could drink. And then Israel cried out and said, We're thirsty again. But now remember, God said, Abraham, I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to bless you, seed. Wherever you go, wherever a Jew might travel in this world, he still has the natural blessing. He won't stay in a place long until he gets rich. He knows how. The blessings of God is upon him in that way. Here stands a man that knew the power of the blood covenant. Water had to come. God would not let his people down. Some way God had to provide. Oh, our needs causes God to perform miracles so many times. And he lifted his rod again and smote the rock and the waters came out. Do you know what? If those people had to believe together, and they believed instead of grumbling and complained, there would have been far greater wonders among them. But they were negative thinkers. They did not believe in the power of the blood covenant. Moses did, Aaron did, but they seemingly couldn't grasp it. I want you to grasp this tonight because once you have, once you understand it, I don't care how many devils come, you have power over every one. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. That old priest took that blood sprinkled it on the brazen altar, on the book, on the people. And then in the most holy place, he stepped. Do you think God would have ever spoke if he had not have sprinkled the blood? No, sir, not without blood. When man fell, the fellowship between man and God was broken. God could not come near him. He had to keep his distance. Even right now, if God would appear in the heavens in all of his glory and circle this earth, every human being out from under the blood would die instantly. No man could receive the Holy Ghost until the blood came. The blood flowed on Calvary before anyone could receive the Holy Ghost. Had the Holy Spirit came into our lives without the blood, we would have died instantly. Because he said, when I see the blood, I don't see your sins. I don't see them. They're all covered. They're all gone. A lady called me not long ago. She was dying. She said, Brother Barnes, do you take medicine? She put me through the third degree. And what I did, didn't do. She told me what she did and how long it had been since she had taken any medicine. Finally, I said, Sister, that's all good, but not good enough. 
I said you've got your faith in what you've done or what I've done or might not have done. And I said if you want deliverance, you better get your faith in what he has done. By his stripes, you're healed. Not something you did or didn't do. It's by his stripes you're healed. Could you praise the Lord for that? Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Our faith so often is in our own self. What we've done. And then we have an inferiority complex. We have, we're afraid to walk in the presence of God. We're afraid to walk in the most holy place and commune with God because of something we did. But if we had faith in the blood like we ought to have, then our faith would be in His forgiveness, His cleansing, and not our doings. And then we could walk into the most holy place and we could stay there until we got what we went after. But we're like the Apostle Peter when he walked on the water. He was doing fine until he heard the wind. And he looked at the waves and he began to sink. And the Lord spoke to me about it and he said, So many of my people, when they walk into the most holy place, they don't stay. They're like Peter. They get their eyes on what they've done or didn't do. And they begin to waver. And then they sink. And they don't get what they come after. When my people, he said, learn to trust in my name and in my blood and in my power and not themselves, then they can come to me and get what they want. Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord! Hallelujah. Praise the Lord! Now I talk to you tonight right from my heart, from experience. We have dealt with all kinds of demons. I have watched the power of God in action. So many marvelous deliverances in the last few months. People who are oppressed by demonic powers and some so depressed until they can't hardly live. This is a cloud of evil spirits that settled down over the people and backs them and cause them to think evil thoughts, thoughts of fear and worry and doubt. Jesus went about doing good, healing all that was oppressed of the devil. A saint can be oppressed by the devil. A saint can be depressed. A saint cannot be possessed. The forces are all on the outside. But we should rebuke them and plead the blood. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Do you know the blood will speak to the devil? Do you know the blood speaks today? Do you know there's protection in the blood? from disease, Hallelujah. from demon power, Hallelujah. from all kinds of oppression. I hear the sad cry day and night of depressed people. I sit in my office hour on top of hour dealing and helping people who are depressed. But to see their face light up and it's all gone. 
And to hear them call six months later, it's still gone. Well, I know that I have got their faith in the right place. We can study psychology until it runs out of our ears. We can believe in the power of positive thinking, and that's good. But unless we believe in the power of the blood that works in us every day, we're going to continually be tormented with depression and oppression and spirits of the devil. But once we understand our rights and plead the blood, But somebody said, well, I thought when you got the Holy Ghost, the blood was applied. It, it was. Amen. I received the Holy Ghost many years ago, but I've got a lot of refillings. Refreshed so many times. We need never to forget this. I remember I was preaching in St. Louis. Some of you ministers might have been there. A bunch of missionaries several years ago. And I felt moved to preach on demon power. Well, we had great crowds, and most anybody had rather preach on shouting or heaven or some great things than to get on demonic powers. And I was debating with myself should I or not? And I was in the day service that day, and other preachers were ministering. And I said, oh, Lord, give me a sign. If this is you talking to me, should I preach on demon power tonight? And as I said that, somebody tapped me on the shoulder and handed me a letter. I looked at the letter, and it was from India, from Brother Sism, while he was yet in India. He said, Dear Brother Barnes, I understand you're preaching to the missionaries. We'll be going out into the fields all over the world. He said, So many of our American ministers don't know very much about demonic powers. And they're going to meet him head on over here. And he said, I hope the Lord deals with you to preach on this. That letter was mailed eight days before to get right there at the right time. The Lord knows everything that's going to happen. He knew eight days before that I'd be sitting there praying, trying to make up my mind what to do. And God wanted me to preach against demon power and show the people how to defeat these terrible, horrible spirits. And I did. And it was a wrestle. Do you think the devil's going to sit around and twiddle his fingers? while you expose him. You know, we need to know where the devil's at. The fellow's on the hill somewhere shooting at you, and you don't know where he's at. You don't have a chance. We need the revelation gift of discerning to know where the devil's at and what he's doing and what he's up to. And he is a liar from the beginning. If we could get our people to stop believing the devil and believe God, this church would be turned upside down. If God said it, it's so. Three million people that God had to feed he had to clothe, and he had to water them because of the blood covenant. Well, God wasn't worried. It was the people worried. God knew what he could do. They didn't know he could make water come out of a rock. 
They didn't know it could rain bread right out of heaven. Do we know it? Amen, amen. The Lord had promised to feed them, to clothe them, protect them from their enemies. And when the enemy came, as long as Moses held his arms up, they won. But whenever he grew tired, uh, the enemy would win. And so they finally caught on, hold the hands of the preacher up. And if ever the church needs to do that, so many times we have criticized and demonic powers invaded our home. And because of what we had said, we didn't get an answer right away. Many a minister has stood by the bedside of somebody's boy, girl dying, could not reach God for him because mom and dad had laid it on the preacher until the boy had no faith in him. This was a man that could touch God, but they had destroyed the boy's faith over the years. And did you know what the parents do? They go away. Never taking the blame. They say the preacher wasn't where he ought to be. My friend, it's something that happened over the years, year in and year out, until demons come and took that boy away from that family because they had learned, he learned to rebel because mom and dad was rebelling. Amen. Do you know the sin that God hates more than all in the catalog? Rebellion. The first sin that was ever committed was rebellion. We need to mark that down. If we want our homes free from demon power, then we must hold the hands of the preacher up that God has called. Somebody said to me the other day, the other night, a minister's wife, just go ahead and tell you. She said, I don't understand it. She said, my people, the people in the church really look up to him, but at home he's different. I said, he's supposed to be different. I said, when he's in the pulpit, some of the gifts of the Spirit are in operation. When he's at home, he's your husband. Amen. I said, if you was married to a doctor, a surgeon, you wouldn't want him to come home operate on you every day, would you? <laughs> Hallelujah. I don't let my wife call me Brother Barnes. My name is Tom. I'm her husband. And the only time I've ever used my pastoral authority on her was in the pulpit whenever it was for everybody. When I'm home, I'm her boss because I'm her husband, not because I'm a pastor. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. We need to get this thing all set right. Praise God. Then we'll keep these demons away. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, I got a call one day. A mother-in-law was crying. She said, come quick. She said, my daughter-in-law is about to kill my son. He was a minister, not Pentecostal, denominational. She said, he has, she's gone off somewhere and gotten to sin, come back, she's gone berserk. She's got a knife. And <clears throat> said, would you go down there? Of course, us preachers, we have to get into everything, you know. <laughs> Never get paid for it. 
only from the Lord. So you go down into that situation, and you go. I go down, and sure enough, oh, I heard some screaming. When I got inside, there was a big handful of hair laying on the floor. Brother, she had demons. I could see them over there. See, they were splashing in their eyes. Demonic powers. That butcher knife. Well, I said, Lord, I'm in the fix here. If you don't help me, I said, it looks to me like she just soon used that on me as on him. Because she don't really know the difference too well. The Lord said, sing. Well, I quit singing a long time ago. These good singers like you had tonight stopped me. Well, I said, what, Lord? He said, sing about the blood. And I began to sing, there's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. I walked around that room singing. Round and round, and finally the preacher got behind me. And he went to singing. We went round and round. After a while, the screaming stopped. You know, you don't always wade in on these, you know, and go slap your hand on the head. It's a good way to get a butcher knife slapped in. The Lord knows how to take care of devils. Amen, amen, amen. You need to think you can handle one of them with physical strength. Wasn't long. She stepped down to begin to march with us. They didn't know what was going on. A little bit. I turned the corner. I saw and I felt something. When you feel that, brother, you're not afraid of anything. Amen. I laid hands on her and she went down. I laid hands on him and he went down. When they come up, she had a smile on her face. I said, y'all put your arms around one another. And the little old children come up. And I said, thank God for the blood, and walked out the door. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, praise the Lord. When I see the blood, I'll pass over you. And let me tell you something else. When the devil sees the blood, he passes by in a hurry. Amen. We need to go back to the old way when we used to plead the blood in our services. We need to go back and lay hands on our doors in our homes and plead the blood. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, you know what? If I hadn't have been under blood, that witch as sure as the world would have had those demons in my house. She knew she had control of some of them. They obeyed her. But I told her, I have power through the word, the blood, and the name over all devils. Brother Mahaney said, just one drop of blood will put him to flight. If we only move tonight, when we lie down to sleep, we plead the blood. Remember what Jesus said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you won't have any life in you. And many of the disciples left him. Amen. We have modernists today, a few in Pentecost. But my friend, if you don't believe in the blood, the sinless blood of Jesus Christ, you're hell bound. Praise God. I believe it with all of my heart tonight. Now listen. Right here, Jesus made the New Testament blood covenant. 
if God was obligated to Abraham's seed because of the blood covenant to feed them, to call them, to protect them from the enemy, what do you think this better covenant, the blood of the cross, will do for us? If we eat his flesh, if we drink his blood, we have cut the blood covenant. Makes the Lord responsible to protect us, to feed us, and to clothe us, and to heal us when we're sick. And he'll do it every time if you come back to the blood covenant. He always keeps his. Now, we talked about the hundred trillion galaxies. And the Lord upholds all of them by the word of his power. Now, the Apostle Paul says we live and move and have our being in him. Now, all of my life and a long time before mine, the Lord put the sun in the sky and said, shine on the earth. And it shined ever since. He put the moon up there to reflect the light of the sun. And it does its job well. He also has air that blows up on this earth for us to breathe every day. So here it is. We have water. We have air. We have sunshine that God has ordained to strike this earth every day then if God has so ordained that we have light and air he also has ordained that we have the Holy Ghost out of heaven through his glorified body right now remember you gotta have the blood the glorified body of Jesus Christ sitting on the throne, right out of his bosom there flows to this entire earth. Holy Ghost power. It's a river. It's striking the earth. It's hitting it now. It's right in this congregation now. The invisible God that has made all things to order has also fixed it that you and I might right now enjoy the blessings of the Holy Ghost is just flowing like rivers right through the air. Now he said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, the blood cleanses from all sin. Everybody say all. all. The moment you believe that. I was talking to a lady a few months ago was sent to me by one of our officials' wife. And <clears throat> all the little things she worried about, the little things here and there and what have you, none of it amounted to anything. And it worried me, it bothered me that anybody could think about backsliding or give up over this. It was just little old things, you know. Don't pray this and that. Don't do this and that. And I was so troubled about it. And that night, sitting on the platform in the youth camp, the Lord spoke to me while everybody else was worshiping. And I knew when I heard that voice, the Lord said, It's not my children's faults and failures and even their sins that bother me, that trouble me the most. He said, but it's their unwillingness to bring them to me that I would forgive them and wash them and make them clean. So that's what he wants us to do, to bring them to him. But you hear people say, but look, I have, I've been doing this for years. He says, keep doing it. Just keep bringing it. Just keep talking to him. There isn't a day that he won't cleanse you. Now to you people tonight that's having demons that's troubling you in the flesh, I want you to take this 
into consideration now the glorified body of Jesus look at the stripes upon that glorified body the only thing from this earth that's upon the body of Christ tonight is the nail scars in his hand and feet and the stripes that was laid upon his back now let's start with that that little old Jewish boy back under the Old Testament covenant, when the Lord said, put the blood on the doorpost and eat of the body of the Lamb. Now, maybe he's sitting there crippled. He can't march. But as he eats of the body of the Lamb, he's healed. Because the Bible said there wasn't a feeble one all the Israelites, three million of them, rose up and walked the highway well because they ate of the body of the Lamb that was pointing to another body, the Supreme One, Jesus on the cross by His stripes. Then you're healed. If the Old Testament covenant, which is circumcision and the offering up of the blood of animals, could bring about such miracles, then what about the one hanging on the cross? What about the stripes that was laid upon his back? And just like those Israelites ate the body of the Lamb, Jesus said, Except you eat my flesh and drink my blood. Don't forget these two. Eat my flesh and drink my blood. What's he talking about? They ate the body of the lamb. They were healed. How do you eat the flesh of Jesus today? You eat it by faith. This is it right here, this book. You eat it by faith. Right now flowing from the throne of God, right through his glorified body, through those stripes, through the very stripes of Jesus, the Holy Ghost flows to you now. This very second, the Holy Spirit has just left, as it were, the stripes that was laid upon his back. Therefore, healing is right here present for everybody that will eat of his flesh. By faith, we eat. By faith, we drink, and our sins are gone. By faith we eat and our diseases are gone. Hallelujah. Let's thank Him for that. Glory. Praise the Lord. Holy Father. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now listen, saints, this is the covenant. This is the New Testament covenant. I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities I'll remember no more. Everybody say no more. What are you remembering them for? He said he didn't remember them. And a lot of times we fall when we go to walk into the most holy place because we're going there to remind him of what he has forgotten 20 years ago. He don't like to be reminded of something he has forgiven us of. And he don't like for us to think about it or worry about it. It's gone forever. Everybody say it, it's gone. Forever. Do you know what the blood did? The blood of Christ is eternal. It's not just a temporary thing. It's eternal. Did you know because of the blood of Christ, there will never be another devil? There will never be another sinner as long as eternity lasts because the blood is eternal. It's forever and ever and ever. God had a twofold purpose, one to erase sin forever and ever, 
as well as to raise it from our lives and save us from sin. Forever, there'll never be another angel, Paul. There'll never be another human being, Paul. After the new heaven and the new earth, it's over because of the blood. Praise the Lord. I was groaning about some past sins that I committed when I was a sinner. And the Lord spoke to me. And he said, if you had have never committed those sins, if you had never committed any sin, had it been possible for you to keep every commandment, everything, no one could ever mark a mark against you. Even I, not being able to find any willful sin in your life, you'd have still died and went to hell because you've got to be born again. No man can be saved without the blood. So you see what I'm talking about tonight? The blood washed it away. It's gone. All right. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest. How? By the blood. By the blood of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. By a new and a living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil that is to save his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart with full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast. Hallelujah, that's the new covenant. It's perfect. Amen, it's perfect. And it puts the enemy on the outside forever. Praise God. I said to somebody not long ago, I said, if you will pray over the doorpost of your house and plead the blood, you're going to see a difference in your children. Because I believe with all of my heart that a house that's dedicated to God, no devil can rule in that house. Amen, amen. I believe that with all my heart. Praise God. Not too long ago, a girl was brought to my office from witchcraft, from California. I want you to see that before it ever came out in the papers, the World Council of Churches is going to try to rewrite this. The devil knew it. She was so possessed with demons until the spirit took over and began to speak through her lips. And she said, I love God, and I love Satan. I love all religions and all people. She said, what we need is a new Bible, a Bible that will love God, Satan, and everybody. She said, if your God has all power, then why don't he forgive Satan? Now this is demonic power speaking. It was not her. These were deep thoughts that came from hell right out there in my office. And I said, Satan, you're a liar. You don't want to repent. You hate God and you'll fight him until he casts you in hell. But the New Love Bible, with no demons in it, is about to appear on the horizon. No blood, no virgin birth, no name, just the love book, they call it, that all people can read and not be offended. 
Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostal, Mormons, any religion on earth, everybody can read it and not be offended unless they believe the truth. Now this is what we're up against today. Powerful forces of hell have come down uh, to try to destroy the doctrines that's so vital and precious to us. And tonight, right now, I take authority and dominion over every spirit in this place that opposes the Word of God, the blood, the name, and the Holy Spirit. I bind it now. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I could tell a lot of personal experiences, but now listen. You're here for one reason tonight, and I've talked to you and told you, if you stay under the blood, full of the Holy Ghost, you'll have no trouble with demons, as far as your own life personally. I don't believe in this scaring people to death with demon power that's full of the Holy Ghost. They have no reason whatsoever to be afraid of anything. Hey, what at all? None at all. But now we're facing a world out there that's demon power loose, killing people, causing suicide, destruction on every side. But how to deal with demons tonight? We go in the name. We go under the blood. We hold the blood banner. Satan's gone. One woman brought to my office. I've been seeing a spiritualist. And she said, when they brought her in, they introduced me. But she couldn't talk. Her lips were sealed. She tried, but she could not. Satan had closed her lips because there was a spiritualist 30 miles away that called her just a little while when she got home and said, you went to see a preacher tonight, didn't you? You see, the devil knows what's going on. But God know, knew before he knew. So I said, Satan, this woman was born a free moral agent. I believe that everybody's a free moral agent. I'm not a hard shell. Amen. I believe man has a right to choose God or the devil. It's up to him. I said, this woman is a free moral agent, and you have no right to bind her. She's going to speak for herself. I command you in the name of Jesus to come out, and you can wait outside. If she wants you whenever we're through, okay. If she wants Jesus, okay. It's her decision, not yours. Immediately, he was gone. She could speak. And I said, now, you realize this power had you. What are you going to do about it? Who do you want? She said, I'm going to take Jesus. And I said, all right, you tell Satan this outside there to leave and never come back that you're through. She said, Satan, in the name of Jesus, I command you to go because I want Jesus in my life. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and then she began to speak with other tongues. As the Spirit of God gave the utterance. The devil has no right to keep anybody away from church. A lot of times we're trying to get folks to come to church, some of our people, and if we'd only take our place and say, Devil, you have no right to keep this person away from church. They are a free moral agent and I bind you. I'm binding you, and then I'm going to believe that person is coming to church, and they're going to choose for themselves who they want, God or the devil. And oh, how many times we've seen that work. And the person becomes a different person. All of a sudden, they change. Their thinking changes. 
Now, there's some here tonight that's thinking of somebody right now that's bound. Tomorrow night, the Lord willing, we're going to talk to you about how to release the power of the Word, the blood, the name, and the Holy Ghost. To release it. And tomorrow night, there'll be people healed, there'll be people delivered, and there'll be people that's not in this building delivered because you believe. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Brother Lumpkin remembers that we was up there a few months ago. We said one night, if you've got someone that's missing, you don't know where they're at, if you're saying the name of Jesus, they're going to dial my number tonight. It'll happen tonight. You've got to believe it. Say it and see it. There was a young man there, his wife. Now, they may be here tonight. I don't know. I hope they are. He didn't know where she's at. She'd left him. He had tried to find her for I don't know how long. But that night, about midnight, she got a feeling that she had to call him. And so she finally just couldn't, she couldn't get away from him. She got out of the bed or got an automobile and she drove 50 miles so he couldn't trace the phone and made a call about 1 o'clock and talked to him till about 4. Amen. Why? Because when you say a thing, you believe it. You hang on to it until it happens. See? That's right. Right. That's right. Praise God. I want you to, I'm telling you this to get your faith outside. You're not just limited inside because God's everywhere. Amen. Everywhere in the world. We get the feeling, oh, God's in this place. God's in this place. God's in every place. And wherever faith touches God, God touches that individual. Amen, amen. We said the same thing in the Ritter, Brother Tennis, one night, one day. He said, there's somebody here with missing loved ones. Brother Tenney told me, after uh, the next day or two, he said, look. He said, there was a lady, her son was missing. And she took you at your word and said, my son is going to dial my number. I but they see him going to the telephone and dialing my number. And when she walked in from the meeting, the phone was ringing. It was him. He said, Mom, I felt like calling you. How come him to feel like calling? Because if somebody prayed, somebody believed. Another one of them's brother had been missing 11 years. Her phones started ringing. She heard a voice. said, it's, Sis, it's me. For some reason, I felt like calling you. I want you to see it tonight. I don't care where he or she is. We have a right to pray the prayer of faith. And did you know the Bible said, In my name you'll cast out devils? In my name you'll bind devils? If there's anything in the world the Lord loves to see, it's his people binding devils. Oh, they can't do it themselves. Oh, you know what I mean. He's backing them up. Whenever they march, the gate opens. Praise God. He loves to see us doing that. And now right here tonight, we have been talking about demon power, the blood, and the power of the Lord is present. And I want us to release our faith right here tonight because God said if you ask anything in my name believing you shall you know what he said everybody say shall, shall. receive it receive. everybody say we shall, we shall. Receive. receive all right now face moving picture it in your mind what do you want what do you want the Lord to do but I said, oh, well, you know, 
Well, we happen to have a young man here on the front. Brother Tommy Yoakum, stand up. All right. Be seated. 1976 in Jerusalem, we was preaching. I walked to the platform. And I said, whatever you ask the Lord for right now, believe in you will receive it. He and his wife had been married several years, no children. No children. His wife said, Lord, I want a baby. That's my request. Well, the Lord gave him a double portion. He gave him two. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Two pretty little boys. Praise God. Hallelujah. God will listen. We sometimes think God's too busy to take care of my little problem. Why, well, he has to count my hair every day because I comb some of them out. <laughs> and I ain't got too many more to comb out. But yeah, he knows how many hair. I combed my hair tonight and I lost a few. And uh, he knows, he can tell you right now if you ask him how many I lost tonight. Praise God. He knows your name and your address and all your children's name. He's right there when they was all born. He was there when you dedicated them to the Lord and said we want them to live for God. Maybe some of them's out where, somewhere they shouldn't be tonight. But don't forget the prayer of faith. The prayer of faith. The prayer of faith. Amen. Can not lose them? I turned to my sister pastor the other day and I said, you know, I said, God's waiting on us to do some things. I said, you set a young fellow in the deer stand with a high-powered rifle. The father said, now, son, there's also bear in these woods, but you have nothing to worry about. You, that rifle will knock a hole in him as big as your fist. But the bear comes, and the boy panics, and he begins to holler, father, help, father. And the father said, shoot him. And oh, how often that soul with us, we holler, Father, do it. And the Lord's already placed with us the power. Everybody's got the Holy Ghost, say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Everybody believes that's power, say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise God. That's power. Amen. A lot of times we're waiting for God to do it when the Lord says, you pull the trigger. Now, somebody said to me, said, are you a prophet? I said, the prophet lives in my house. Somebody said, are you a healer? I said, the healer lives in my house. If you've got the Holy Ghost, he lives in yours too. Amen. He's prophet. He's healer. He's everything. Praise God because the Holy Ghost is power. Amen. Everybody say the Holy Ghost is power. And I can release it in Jesus' name. And I now release my faith. Praise the Lord. 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 Would you stand to your feet? You've got a prayer you want the Lord to answer. You believe in it. You know it's going to happen. Praise God. I believe you've got a right to bind the devil that's trying to bind your children. God said, I know Abraham, he'll command his children. You see, Daddy had cut the blood covenant. And 
so have we. These little ones that God has given to us. And then here comes a filthy old devil. I often hear people ask, they ask me the question, can a homosexual be healed? I said, is God alive? If he is, it's just another sin that they can bring to Jesus. If Jesus can't take care of a homosexual, he can't take care of nothing else. He can take care of anything that anybody wants him to take care of. Hey, man. Hallelujah. I've seen them delivered. I know what I'm talking about. Unclean spirits that love pornography. Somebody, Brother Mahaney said something about rock music. Well, that's, you look at pornography and pictures. Rock music is pornography. And music, it's ugly. Amen. Just as bad to have the filthy stuff in your house as it is to have... What, I don't know what kind of magazine that was he said a while ago. It must have been a bad one. Playboy, some of them. Whatever they are. And well, rock music in there is pornography and music. You have a magazine, that's pornography and picture. God help us to clean house and to let our children know that there are demons in rock music. The heathens call up devils with music. A lot of people say, oh my, I don't know what's wrong in my house. So it's just, I don't know, there's a shadow there. Come to find out they've got books on witchcraft. Oh, wild rock music. They bring that into God's house and break the blood covenant. And then everything goes wrong. We expect God to keep his. We ought to keep ours. Amen. You've got something tonight you want the Lord to do. Raise your hand. I don't know what it is, but you do. Everybody say in Jesus' name. Jesus name. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord. You have seen every hand. You know every request. We ask you, Lord, to heal the sick. Save the lost. Set the captives free. For this night, we bind every devil in Jesus' name. We plead the blood. We ask your help, Lord. Set everyone free in Jesus' name. Amen.